Hello everybody, nice to see you all again. My name is Winback and on today's episode we will be hunting down the barrel home nemesis named the Reaper of the Lost. The Reaper is a huge Wendigo monster that deals a shitload of vitality damage and if that isn't spooky enough, he's got a bunch of minions that follow him around as well. Before we get started, though, remember it is a YouTube video, so make sure that you chomp that like button, cannibalize the comment section, and subscribe to the Forest of Blood Crazed Maniacs. So let's talk about location. Location, location, location. The Reaper of the Lost is located in only five areas. Now before you go celebrating, let me lay these out for you. First, there is the Altar of Ratosh, then the Den of the Wendigo, followed by the Forlorn Cellar. Not necessarily in that order, but the last two are the absolutely massive undertakings of Gloomwald and Ugdenbog. And here I was thinking that we'd suffered enough through the Kuba Cabra fight, but no. We're going to have to continue to struggle right on through the massive swampy backwater that are these areas. My heart's already sank out of my butt, but now that we've ripped the proverbial band-aid off, we can look at the exploration plan here and get some efficiency. If we're being honest, it's not really a whole lot of efficiency required, uh, but because those two areas are so large, taking care of the other three first is always a good plan. So let's start with the Altar of Ratosh. If you remember from the story, this is the location that you take Ulgrim's Keepsake to to enter the Void as you venture upwards to Malmoth. It's way up on the north side of the map, and you can get there the easiest if you take the Barrel Home Riftgate. And once you're there, you're going to knock out a little breakable wall and just take that path all the way up once the wall is broken. Since the area is so small, you'll notice the Reaper right away once you get to the tippy top of things. But if we didn't get mega lucky there, we can start checking the Ugenbog map off of our list. Or we can TP right back down to Barrowholm to check the den in the cellar instead if you want to knock those out first. I opted for the Ugdenbog exploration because I'm a masochist, but if you decided to take the cellar route, all you need to do is go into Barrowholm and then head southeast to the Forlorn Cellar, which is right there on the map with the little eyeball icon. The cellar is pretty small and you can easily see if the Reaper is in there, but if he's not, all you need to do is head further down into the only other location in the cellar. This is the Den of the Wendigo, which is yet another small time dungeon in which we can almost immediately see the Reaper. The other really cool thing about these two dungeons is that if you need to farm infamy for this nemesis still, they will net you about 2,000 infamy per run. You only need 20k to get to the nemesis mode, so realistically this won't take terribly long, even from the lowest level. That being said though, uh, if you're running it on ultimate, just remember everybody is really big, really angry, and those hero monsters do hurt a lot. In fact, there is one hero monster specifically down there who can turn off all of your uh, passives and uh, overtime abilities that you have going, making it really, really, really difficult to kill if you are a melee character. So, if you're going to do that, if you find that enemy, you'll know it immediately. And honestly, I just restarted the session immediately because he sits right at the beginning of the cellar and it was incredibly annoying wasn't dying and neither were any of the people around him because i had all of my damage turned off involuntarily if you run my route though uh, from the ratosh to uchtenbog you really just run from the top of the map all the way down to the bottom since this area is so massive it's really just a huge left to right scan and the monotony is absolutely top tier on this one. So if you manage not to find the Reaper here, you're going to need to repeat that process in the Gloomwald location. And that's really all there is I can say about that. Gloomwald is a little bit more pathy. Uh, there's definitely more open expanses. It's a little bit more linear than Ugdenbach is. But it is still ultimately just huge and lots and lots of running is required. Since these places are so large and so full of mammoth-sized enemies, there's really no escaping it apart from getting lucky on the little areas. 
So hey, if you really want to save time, maybe you just restart your session until you get lucky, or maybe that's even more time. Go with what you feel. Live your life. Now we're talking about combat. We've moved on. We have to fight. And this one is not nearly as easy as the Archmage. In fact, the Reaper of the Lost is absolutely more terrifying to fight than, say, a tiny, oh, you know, wizard guy or hulking mass of bones. Uh, as previously stated, this antlered asshole is going to be dealing insane amounts of vitality damage. He also has enormous resistances to both chaos and aether damage, so all of you cultists and meat puppet players out there might have a tougher time. In terms of abilities that the Reaper has, his autos have charge levels, and at 100% he's going to get 24% crit damage added on, percent bonuses to both offensive and defensive ability, as well as a huge chunk of movement speed. That basically means that once this guy starts hitting you, you'll really never be able to get away from him because he can't be CC'd, and yet again, health reduction stuff does not work very well on him. Now, on top of his rage-fueled falcon punches, he also has a Nova ability that will fire out purple projectiles that reduce your resists, slow you by 60%, deals piercing and vitality damage, reduces a 10% portion of your health, and then on top of all that terror, they will return after they are fired in case they didn't hit you. So he will shoot out the Nova, and then they will travel back towards him, so make sure that you are dodging as much of them as possible, because it's basically a boomerang of death. After that, the Reaper can spawn two different types of wraiths, and if you know the Reap Spirit uh, for the Necromancer, you have an idea of what this works like. The wraiths that are summoned can be summoned two at a time, up to a maximum of 12, and they also have a lot of lifesteal while doing vitality damage, so letting them stack up to that 12 maximum can get pretty messy. Now that we've mentioned the big guy's abilities and summon, let's circle back to the passive effects that can trigger off of his regular attacks. The Reaper has three passives that each have a 9% chance to activate of increasingly horrifying effects. This means that there is at any point 27% of a chance to get hit by something really, really bad. So the first is the least horrific option. This is only going to do a bunch of physical and vitality damage. And when I say it's the least, it's still going to do a lot of damage when he hits you. The next option up is a cleaving physical and vitality damage attack that will also stun you for one second. Did you get stunned while all the purple death novas were rocketing back towards the reaper? Well, that's very likely your death. The final option is the Haymaker from Hell itself. You'll be hit by the standard physical and vitality damage on the auto attack. But on top of that, you'll also take bleeding damage, lose 15% of your health, and take a massive reduction to your defensive ability while dropping your resistances by almost half. This means that if you don't have your resistances properly overmaxed, that you may very well have just disintegrated after getting hit by this random satanic one-punch. Sound awful? Well, we're not done yet. Even after all the Reaper... Even after all of that, the Reaper has passives that can be used uh, for about six seconds. He has this ability... It is on, I believe, a 20-second cooldown. I think that's what Grim Tools said, but the six seconds that he does have it up... He's going to restore 8% plus about 25,000 of his health, give him 45% damage to everything, 25% to his attack speed, and then 20% to his movement speed. So I don't think I can really oversell just how easy it is for the Reaper to literally eat you alive ass first. Now, all of the movement speed that he gets from auto-attacking you, the passive how hard his auto attacks hit. Really, all you have to do is survive those autos, make sure not to die to the minions, and try not to get hit by the uh, boomerang nova, and you can survive. I, it took me a death to get through him, but I did have to pop every ointment and lotion and you know preparation H that I had, but we made it. I died one time, we got the kill. Thank God, it's over. 
Let's say that you managed to get through all of that, though. Uh, how about we look at some monster infrequence? The first are the Reaper's leggings, because sometimes you just don't feel like putting on real pants when you go out in public. These bad boys will give you a 40 to 60 offensive ability, increase your vitality resistance by a very large amount, and then give you a plus three to emboldening presence, hellfire, and Oleron's rage. So all your shamans, demolitionists, and soldiers out there will definitely like these pants. If you don't get those, you'll get yourself a pair of Reaper's leg guards instead, and these will give you offensive ability, but exchange the vitality resistance for pierce resistance instead. From here, you also get plus three to Blade Spirit, Soul Harvest, Blood Pack, and Eye of Reckoning. So most importantly, if you're a Night Blade who needs some pets, or you're an Oath Keeper that likes to spin, keep your eyes open for these bad boys. And that is it, everybody. Nice and short when all things considered. Short and terrifying, just the way I was brought into this world. Maybe. I don't actually know if that's a true statement, but in this moment, that's the story I'm going with. So peace out, everybody. I will see you next time. <laughs>